Love that. that. Uh, this is the OGM community check-in call Thursday, July 21st, 2022. And uh, hey, Mike, you're in an airport? Not up or down, left or right? Um, looks like you're in an airport, maybe. And I saw on the news just now that Biden has tested positive for COVID. Um, it was in the New York Times list of things I didn't look at. Didn't have a chance to, to take a look at. It's um, a long list. I, God, it's incredible sometimes. Klaus, nice to see you. Uh, somebody remixed the new uh, JWST deep space photo with Starry Night. And it's, a, it's an image, uh, which I will see if I can't share with you because I'm pretty sure I have it now on my computer. Yeah, here we go. Uh, let me at least screen share and show it. Uh, go back here, share screen, think, and go back. Oops, wrong thing. There we go. There. So that is a uh, blend of the two. It's cool. not bad. It's not bad. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's just stunning. <clears throat> kind of fun. Um, how is everyone? Okay, despite all the flurry of things. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> does anybody else subscribe to No Opinion, um, the newsletter? This is uh, by Noah Smith. He's got a Substack pub. He's sort of an economist um, at Stony Brook and very opinionated. And last night, the last thing I read, which may not have been the best thing to read before sleep, but uh, he basically was writing about how degrowth, doomsaying, and uh, third strategy, I'm forgetting right now, are not going to work. They're just, they're just unrealistic. They're not going to work. And then he talked about other dynamics and uh, he, he, he makes, if nothing else, a pretty clear case for his argument, which I'm going to try to find the time to model out as one end of how one could look at this and needs to look at this. And he's kind of blending political realism <clears throat> with uh, dynamics and motivation with what you can do and can't do at a societal level with a bunch of other stuff. Um, and I think it's, you know, totally open to contradictions, oppositions, write-ups, whatever else. Uh, I'll, I'm going to forward his newsletter to the OGM mailing list right now and uh, put a pointer to it in the chat. Uh, yeah, is that is that the most recent one, Pete? Or Allison? Sorry. I was so used to Pete putting them up so fast that that I went straight to Pete. Uh, right. Thanks, I think Allison. that was posted, yeah, yesterday. So yesterday. Uh -huh. So uh, yeah. it, actually, this one's titled "How Will We Fight Climate Change?" Oh, okay. So that's at the top. Thanks. Yeah, and let me uh, get that URL now. Uh, somebody's put it in, I think. Uh, no, that's that's the whole channel. Ken put in uh, his whole channel. Uh, okay. Here, here is the one I'm in particular. I'm I'm thinking about. Okay. Um. And it made my brain go in lots of different directions, but it made my brain go very OGM. It made me think a lot about what we do and how we do it. Uh, I wanted to kind of crab the article if, uh, so to, to figure out how to deconstruct it and uh, um, deepen it and tag it up and other sorts of things. So um, that's the thing we might do. Uh, this being a check-in call, we kind of go, um, we alternate rhythms uh, between a topic and check-ins, why don't we go uh, Klaus with the with the starry sky, Klaus, uh, Pete, Allison? Yeah, I'm just putting in uh, a conversation I was listening in on yesterday between Yuval Noah Harari and then a philosopher I've never really heard of, and it is should be trust nature more than ourselves, you have to rewind it. I, I didn't put it in the right spot here. 
But the thrust of the conversation basically is that you will Harari was talking about nature is nature that does what it does. It is what it is, right? There is there is no negotiation with nature. And the philosopher talking about all the gyrations that we are going through to challenge that assumption, you know, to to uh, think we can do something different. And I'm actually in a real funk right now. I had a meeting yesterday with uh, a group of Oregon-based NGOs, about uh, 30 some NGOs like the Oregon Climate and Agriculture Network and uh, groups of the High Desert Food and Farm Alliance. And we talked about soil and water. And uh, you know, Oregon is uh, in a drought, not as bad as California, but you know, this the high desert uh, region here of Oregon, the in, uh, central Oregon, is in pretty bad shape. Just one stat: I mean, about eighty percent of the nation's carrot seed comes from the high desert, you know, from the central Oregon, and they had to they had to fallow half of their land for lack of water. That means. <laughs> I mean, it's forty percent of uh, carrot seeds are not going to make it, right? I mean, you just think about random stuff like this. So we had someone make a presentation on border rights in Oregon, and this is the you know, same thing you see in California. These border rights were assigned one hundred and twenty years ago, you know, when the first settlements came in, and they're attached to the land. So when you buy a piece of land that has attached border rights. And these border rights are at seniority level. So here in the in the Central Oregon region, 86% of all border is assigned to agricultural farms. Uh, and there isn't enough water to go around. There wasn't enough water 120 years ago when they assigned these border rights. Now, and of course, now you have you have this traumatic scenario. So in order to change anything, you know, when it comes to water management and agriculture and so on, you have to, first of all, make it through the political process of wrestling water rights away from people who are fiercely defending it. And they're defending it by, for example, flooding their fields, because if they don't use the water, they lose it, right? And so, so this whole system is just so insane. You don't know where to start untangling it. And, and in all reality, I mean, from a practical perspective, when you, you know, listen to uh, opinions like Jerry just mentioned, I don't see how we're going to get through this in time to make a difference because we're already, you know, at, at, a, at a breaking point um, where, where uh, agriculture, you know, and, and the, the global food supply is challenged uh, I mean, look at the Europeans, right? The 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 worldwide, you you have a reduction in yields and and in uh, uh, in in access to water and so on. So I don't know. I mean, I just think this has to crash. I mean, I keep I keep uh, you know thinking what what can you possibly say to people uh, to to get them to understand the seriousness of this? And so another thing that struck me. I mean, these are all people who are working in the field, climate change and agriculture and water and all of this. And at the end of this conversation, I had one lady say, I could, I, I had to tune out. It's just overwhelming to listen to all this negativity and all this horrible uh, uh, no, stuff heading at us. But, you know, I mean, tuning out is not making it go away either. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's just it's just really overwhelming uh, to 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 deal with this, and and I'm like winding down here. I'm getting really tired, you know, dealing with this stuff every day, and and uh, uh, trying to renew my my energy, and and uh, and so many people really want to make a difference and want to help, and 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 all of that, but then. You know, I mean, for example, you know, the Sierra Club and Citizen Climate Lobby have basically been told by their funders to stay out of the farm bill, right? I mean, Sierra Club got $130 million from Bloomberg. Uh, I mean, so they are, you know, they have funding. They're, they're deeply penetrated with funding sources you know, from people who have opinions. And, and, and the staff depends on, on those funding sources you know, for, their, for their budgets. And for their livelihood, 
And when you know, and, and the farm bill is just you know nothing but disruption and, and disruptive forces. Go ahead, Jerry. No, you're muted. Sorry, first time on Zoom. Um, if I can bring this in for a second, uh, Mika Sifri, uh, who is in here a little bit, but he wrote a newsletter recently, but he and I talked about it beforehand, which was um, Bloomberg has had a very strange effect on gun activists. And a part of what happened apparently to the Marjorie Stoneham Douglas kids is they started getting a lot of attention. They went out on the road to try to convince people to pass some gun legislation. And Bloomberg, which already was funding Mothers Against Guns or whatever it was, I'm forgetting the orgs, I've got them in my brain, but um, they basically showed up and said, we know exactly how to absorb names and put them in a database, but you need to sign these papers. They basically signed away rights to a whole bunch of stuff. And there were a bunch of things that sounded kind of directive, manipulative, and limiting toward what the Douglas school kids could or should do in some way. And I, I was... Uh, my head was turned on the influence of funders, and if they have a particular agenda which is hidden from view, how that might turn out. So you're mentioning Bloomberg here, and I don't want to blow this out into something much larger than, than it might be, um, but I think that happens a bunch. I think that, that one way of controlling uh, activists who might be doing really good work is to make sure they got enough funds to be around, but not so much that they actually like tip the cart. And then, you know, not tackling the farm bill is a huge thing because the farm bill really desperately needs to be redone. Yeah, but there, there is just so much political power behind this. And and we, we have gained traction. I mean, we have really made everybody very nervous because it's a multi-pronged approach, right? So on the one point, we focus on farming and water. So by shifting from climate change to water, much of the defense that they had all prepared is melting away because everybody is worried about water. Uh, and water focusing on water has the same impact on agriculture as you're saying, I need uh, to, to carbonize the soil. Right? So it's the same thing. Um, but there is no defense there. Then we go into the uh, consumer side and we're talking about glyphosate in the breast milk of mothers, you know, glyphosates in urine samples of babies. Which is now the, the documented now it's out there, and the Supreme Court has already rejected arguments against the lawsuit that uh, Monsanto uh, and Bayer lost in regard to the impact of glyphosate on cancer. Right, so there's no defense here. So so the the uh, so the the farm bill debate is getting really. Uh, the, um, intense and there is traction here where we can influence both the consumer and uh, on, on both ends really and so it, it was i mean it was just stunning to like for my webinar i get absolute support right i mean no money nothing um because uh, uh they basically have been told to stay out of the frame mm -hmm. right here so I, anyway, but I mean, the, the thing really is, how do you how do you energize this to the point where people really understand what's at stake here? And we're not anywhere near that. And, you know, when, if you wait through this summer and you queue up the next growing season without having made any changes, this is going to get really bad. Mm -hmm. And right this minute, we're going through all these traumatic weather events worldwide. It's, uh, it's really weird and strange and disconcerting. And and what we don't pay attention to is that the core driver of this is the Gulf Stream slowing down. Mm -hmm. Now, and there's, I mean, you're not about to restore the Arctic ice. I mean, so that's a done deal. Now, and and by by and if this there is actually a risk, you know, that this thing could stop because there is there is a tipping point, you know, where where and there, there is a really good video, that, and I think I posted it before. That explains the way this guy explains that in some detail, where where uh, you know, the the slowdown is already measurable, and there could be a point where where the system collapses, which would have catastrophic climate impacts, particularly for Europe and the east coast of the U.S. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, so there's no good news really, is there? Um, Eric puts in the chat um, that. Uh, politicians need a way to save their face so if you can help them find that angle they're more likely to support you and i'm really torn because the same argument is happening with putin's invasion of ukraine is like does putin need an off-ramp 
to basically make it gently off somewhere else so that he doesn't push the nuclear button kind of argument. And, and I'm torn. I, I don't know where I land on this. I think it's a really hot, interesting, active question. The, in, in the background, my inner voice is saying, there's a bunch of people in this country who need action, not adjustment, not adaptation. And there's also a bunch of players in the field who are taking advantage of adaptation and face saving mechanisms and whatever else. Like Manchin appears to me to be doing his funders job really, really well and to be very efficiently blocking, you know, uh, what more than half the country would like to get done. Uh, and by playing along and offering him alternatives and whatever else, the Democrats have wasted a tremendous amount of time, which is his job, I think, is to eat time. Uh, I'm being a little pessimistic about it here. So, so there's, a, there's a piece of me that feels like strategically that no exit, let's just do the right thing and see how we can get it done strategy might actually work better appealing to the voters who wanna see action and who have seen action by people who wreck the room. Um, that may be too cynical a, a point of view. I don't know. And Eric, if you want to reply or, or whoever else, uh, otherwise, uh, Eric, if you want to, if not, yeah. uh, Mike just raise his hand. Well, that's just something I heard years ago uh, from another group and just bringing it forward. So, uh, something for people who are trying to advocate with politicians in Washington or wherever. So I, I know it, it sucks, but... Uh... So that's the way the game is played and you're trying to make a positive change in the farm bill it's wh whoever's working in that arena will need to use the right strategies that's yeah it. thank you and, and i would normally come from the how do we accommodate other people how do we reach them where they're at that, that's my normal approach and i'm losing patience on that and uh, let's go mike and then i might actually poke ken and see how ken feels about that topic um mike please I just wanted to speak up for creative log rolling. Mm. Um, I've, I've been in Washington since 1988, and the first issue I worked on was climate change. And I got into internet later, but the fact was we were trying to get the Bush administration, the, the first Bush administration, to do some of the right things to cut greenhouse gases. And we actually got rid of half of the impact of the greenhouse gases that we were pumping into the atmosphere in the 1980s because Al Gore and others pushed the Bush administration to sign the Montreal Protocol, which eliminated the gases that lead to the ozone hole. If we hadn't done that, we'd have twice as much global warming today. And so that was an example of where, because there was one goal, saving the ozone layer, we actually made progress on greenhouse gases because CFCs are like 16,000, even 60,000 times more potent mm -hmm. as greenhouse gases. And the irony was on the whole issue of climate change, we had allies in the White House, but they weren't environmentalists, they were nuclear power advocates. Bush's science advisor was a nuclear physicist. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he thought it was great that Al Gore was highlighting the need to cut down fossil fuel emissions because it was a great way to push back against the anti-nuclear crowd. And that, that's what we need to be doing. I mean, finding places where there may be a 50% overlap or a 70% overlap, way too often Democrats and Republicans, and you know, they, they have their pure mission and they can't bring other people on board because those people only sign up for 60 or 70% of their goals. And I, I get so frustrated. I'm, I'm a radical centrist. I'm trying to find a way to get uh, people to agree on those things that 80 or 90% of Americans agree on. Right. But right now it's all about polarization and fundraising. And if you're the most extreme voice, you get more money. So part of my inner narrative, Mike, is that the Gingrich revolution in 94, that Newt Gingrich led the way toward severing all of the loose connections that existed between the parties so that they no longer would come into contact with each other and no longer find moments where they could log, roll some logs or right. chew, some, chew some pork pork ears or whatever. No, uh, 
earmarks, uh, you know, <laughs> all, all that kind of stuff, right? The, uh, the kind of things that that fed Congress critters so that they could go back to their constituents and say, look, we did something you like. Um, is that true or false? I mean, if, if that's true, then the opportunity for, for creative log rolling is really slim right now. It's that's part of the reason. And, and the members of the House in particular only sleep in Washington two or three nights a week. You know, they, they don't have time for those summer, those Saturday barbecues with members of the other party. Their staff are still here, but there's definitely a our team, your team kind of situation. The, the, the bars that the Republican staff go to are different than the bars that the mm -hmm. Democratic staff go to. And during COVID, it got even worse mm -hmm. because the Republican staff only went to bars where they weren't compelled to wear a mask. It was, it's just, it, it's, it's so frustrating. But the bigger problem, even more than the social interaction, the bigger problem is this sense that if you're not the most extreme voice, you know, if you're not out there saying, um, you know, uh, outlaw coal, or on the other side, we will oppose all law that might impact coal production and burning, if you're not the most extreme voice, then somebody will be more extreme and they will attract more money from the people who care about that position. Mm -hmm. And it's also this old game. I mean, Gingrich was famous for this is, you know, try to go for three times more than you have any reason to expect, you know, ask for the extreme and, uh, you know, settle for half or one third. Right. And Trump does it too. Trump would, you know, grab hostages. He would do things that he, had no one, he, he would do things he would, he would put forward proposals he didn't even want as a way to trade them off for the things he did want. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mike. Um, Ken, do you want to jump in? Don't know that I have anything particularly um, profound to add. I think uh, we're looking at a very broken system, and it's the only system we happen to have. And how do you, how do you have enough? Um, a question for me, I guess, is is how do I maintain enough distance to my desires to see change, recognizing that they're probably not going to come true, and still get in there and, and work in some way to drive me effective? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's days when it's like, oh, it's, fuck it all. You know, it's just it's all too broken, and and there's times it's like, well, but we have to do something, and. Um, I come back to um, with the Republicans, you know, Upton Sinclair says it's difficult to get a man to see your point of view when his paycheck depends on him not seeing it. And Pete's um, uh, hyperscale entities, which, you know, these are not people who are looking out for the common good. They're looking out for their own interests and their interests are at odds with the common good. And so, you know, how do we reconcile that? Um, because if we keep going for, we're going to support all the special interests, we're going to end up with no common good and everybody's going to fail. So, you know, that's the kind of large scale framing I have. And I'm confused. I just, I, I, there's, there's days when I just honestly don't know what to do. And I throw my hands up and, you know, um, I, I'm just trying to stay in, in the game and stay as positive as I can and do what I can where I am, recognizing that there's probably going to be really big things falling apart and crashing to the ground all around me and I'm trying to make sure I'm nimble enough to get out of the way of them falling. Thanks, Ken. Uh, anyone else on this topic? Otherwise, I'll go back to our queue. Um, cool. Let's go Pete, Allison, Ken. And Pete, thanks uh, for the flex last night. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, tough to, it's tough to change the topic away from existential death. But I will. Um, Klaus, I, I wonder if you could put a link to the, your webinar um, in the chat. For yeah. folks. It's coming up in a week, and um, I think it's a great thing you're doing, Klaus. Thanks. Um, real quick, I wanted to put a link to, as as part of the, the journalism of Plex, um, I set up a community calendar, um, and uh, and I guess I'm proud of it. <laughs> Uh, even though I'm not sure, um, well, it is what it is. I'm proud of it. Uh, so there's a two-step thing. You go to this page, and then you have to figure out that you need to click here. Um, it turns out that I couldn't embed a Google spreadsheet very well, and this is how this is built. 
Um, the way this uh, the way this is set up, it shows a week um, during summer time. Um, I wanted to call this daylight savings time or or summertime or something like that. It turns out, especially because of uh, the the other hemisphere, they're they're not in summer right now. They're in winter. Um, so anyway, uh, this is kind of the summertime hours, and they're going to shift an hour or so uh, from UTC uh, in the future. Um, so uh, yellow is the weekly calls, blue are the ones that are bi-weekly or monthly, some of them. Uh, there's one closed call kind of, which I, I was a little wondering if I should even put it on here, but I, I think if you emailed Jerry and said, what is that FJB thing? I really want to be in there. Um, he'd probably say, yeah. So um, uh, part of the reason to, I, I don't mean this for to be readable on the screen, by the way, I'll have to click the link. Um, uh, part of the reason to do this is we're starting an experiment called office hours. Um, so I've got office hours here on Tuesdays, and Grace Rickmani has two, uh, which is the right way to do it, <laughs> um, morning and evening. So this morning in Europe for her is is uh, quite crazy for the U.S. folks, but between one and the other one, she's she's awake for this time, and she's also overlapping you know, the US and the rest of the world. Um, just kind of want to note it, um, maybe think about doing your own office hours, um, uh, start to look for calls that you haven't been going to and and wonder how they fit into your schedule. Um, one, one final thing, every every row is an hour. So Grace's calls, uh, uh, Lionsburg calls, they actually overlap and I just made them bigger. Uh, so it's not like, let me schedule my day. It's more like, let me find my week and kind of uh, orient to it. How do you want to handle overlaps? Because as we start doing personal office hours, they're just going to overlap with stuff. It's it's a really good question. And um, the... Um, and I thanks for doing... First, with... first, thanks for doing this. This is brilliant. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time... Uh, I, <laughs> it's a really good question. Uh, I don't know yet. Um, to get this to even this state, uh, already I've got overlaps. Um, I've got a couple of places where things overlap. And mm -hmm. and in a spreadsheet to do that, I've actually got two columns and lots of merged cells in various places that, that make the whole thing work. Okay. I think I'm going to have to move to a different representation of this, but I'm, I'm up for the challenge. Um, I'm, I think it might move out of Google Sheets at some point. And I think this is adaptive in the way you just showed for a while. So this looks like it'll work yeah. great. And it's easy. And Google Sheets are easy to embed in pages. So we could drop this on a OGM yeah. wiki page, a massive wiki page. We could kind of each embed it. Um, yeah. The, uh, the other thing is uh, part, of the, part of the reason is to draw it like this. Uh, Jordan was wondering, you know, how do I know where in the, you know, in the Plex to slot things into a week? And now he's got a picture, you know, here's some holes. And so hopefully it will also encourage people not to overlap. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Klaus and Allison. Yeah, <clears throat> Peter, I have a, I have a question. I, I keep puzzling about what Lionsberg is, is up to and, and what the deliverables are. Can, can you, do you have a little synopsis of here's, here's what we're going to do or accomplish or focus on um the uh it's it's much more um uh much more inspirational <laughs> to hear uh jordan tell the story um but the the gist of it is i from my point of view uh uh jordan is kind of jordan and the rest of us are trying to instantiate a different way of working together basically um so that um uh, we have a lot more, um, I, th I think we have a lot more, I think smaller entities that come up faster and can, and, and can be more agile and also much, much, much better flocking um, so that uh, climate change is like too hard, too big or, or soil health or something like that is right now kind of too hard for me to wrap my head around how you would attack something like that. But the idea is even a, a really big problem if you've got um, if you if you've got not a couple dozen organizations working on or a couple hundred organizations, but if you had a, a ten thousand or a hundred thousand or a million organizations working on it, each of them very small and focused on kind of what they what they thought was right. Um, if you inspire everybody to be working together, kind of, and not necessarily like on the same team, but in a team of team of teams way. 
um, you hopefully will get people working towards um, the greater good for the planet and planet and people, basically. Um, it's and uh, one of the things I like to say in the in it, it's bootstrapping is very hard. Um, uh, you know, we're we're trying to work on new social structures to work together, um, and it's really confusing to do that while at the same time, you know, almost all the examples we have are are other ways of working that haven't worked as well. Um, it's hard to it's hard to communicate what we are doing to because we don't know it ourselves. So people kind of join us and then it's like, so what are you guys doing? And it's like, well, we're still trying to figure it out. We're building runway where we're trying to take off the plane. <clears throat> it's hard and it's confusing and and you know it, so for many people, it's a little bit too early to be um, to be engaging deeply and then the way to do it um uh, uh i can speak about my project kind of massive wiki um which you know kind of if you look at it objectively maybe it doesn't have a lot to do with saving the planet um but but it's the thing that i can work on strongly um and bill hi thanks uh for working on it with me um uh it it does i think help you know, it's a tiny, tiny piece of the infrastructure that's needed. So um, uh, for people who are interested, uh, so for, this is a weird kind of example because I don't, m most people aren't interested in working on the nuts and bolts of Massive Wiki, um, which is fine, not, not complaining. Uh, but uh, you can join a project that is kind of aligning itself with mass, uh, with uh, the meta project um, and um, and mostly be working on that project. You could be working on um, helping uh, local farm farmers, uh, you know, uh, approach their uh, local representatives about the water or soil or something like that. And there's a I think one of the things that's really going to be strong with the Meta Project is that you don't have to be working on everything in the Meta Project because there's going to be a lot of stuff. You can be working on something that's really meaningful to you in a local context and get a lot of stuff done. And some interfaces are going to be helping find the rest of the interfaces of other people to join together to, to uh, work together towards a, a much, much, much bigger goal. The one, one last thing, um, uh, there's a, it, it's confusing just to say, so what's the difference between Lionsberg and Meta Project? And then we have two Meta Projects, one with capital letters and one with lowercase letters. And brackets. Meta Project, uh, <laughs> and then there's brackets. <clears throat> um, Meta Project is, is kind of the movement of all of these things flocking together. Lionsburg is is kind of in the old world. I might describe it as something like a um, uh, orienting foundation that helps guide the you know the movement that's meta project. And it's there. It doesn't mean to Lionsburg in particular. It doesn't mean to enclose the whole movement. Um, people might be working on the meta project and not know much about it. Just they're just joining almost a hashtag movement, right? Um, uh, so uh, it's. Um, there's a, we've got other things. It's like, why the meta project? Why Lionsburg? Wouldn't you pick a better name for that? And it's like, yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Let's just flock together. That's the big, the big goal. This may be metaphorically off, but I kind of sometimes think of Lionsburg as Cape Canaveral, which is like, it's a launch pad trying to get other orgs into orbit, uh, into a, into a particular or set of orbits, but, but something like that. I'm not sure that's very good. And then in parallel with your calendar, a thing we've been working toward, and in particular, Vincent Arena has been working toward with Trove, is there should still be a landing page for each of our projects in the flotilla that basically somebody could go stare at and is kept up to date by the, the, the community around each of the projects where you can see, here's our mission, here's where we are right, here's like a little arrow with we are here uh, without trying to over-bureaucratize the whole thing, and here's what would happen if you were to join us, or here are our raw materials, the things that we've built so far are on these directories on GitHub or in Google Drive or wherever else. That would be a super lovely thing to have in parallel with the calendar and to have these things point back and forth to each other, et cetera. If you're, and if you're energized for that, Vincent is, Vincent's got something he's built and, um, and it's operating. Uh, you can put your organizations in Catalyst. Um, he's also working with uh, some of the Meta Project folks on something called Map Weavers, which has kind of got some similar similar intent. Um, I, th I think I think that I think we need is 
um uh the there's there's uh in in meta project there's an interesting thing there's uh, a group of tool makers like uh, vincent and me and then there's uh, what we call social dimensions a, a group of people who are interested in the psychology of working together and things like that um there's a middle part where um uh lionsburg meta project right it kind of has a, a vacuum um and uh and ogm has a similar vacuum uh the vacuum it it became obvious to some of us that um vincent and i can build stuff but we kind of need a layer of people helping us adopt stuff um uh working on the ux yeah user experience the you know the way these tools work with with people who are just trying to get stuff done, right? So um, for OGM, um, it would be a great help to start moving into Catalyst more or moving into the Mapweaver stuff more, and then also helping us figure out how to get tools adopted, help help people adapt to tools like Catalyst and profiles and things like that. Awesome. Um, Allison, sorry for the very long wait to get to you. But the floor is yours. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, with a hand up. Yeah, yeah. No, I just had yeah. a question about um, the calendar and just to make sure that I was reading it right. So, Pete, I'm seeing, um, let's see, actually, I'd have to open up the calendar again. It's kind of past um, moment here. But um, Grace's two hours is in, a, is in conflict. It's happening at the same time as this other call. Is that right? Yep. Okay um yeah yeah and okay. you know the the so grace has two calls so you could just go to another one of hers um the call that's conflicting there is uh dawn of everything which only happens every two weeks and it's a fairly specialized call uh too so um Great. the uh, the idea is to yeah. kind of pick and choose the things that are interesting to you um and mm -hmm. hopefully there'll be more calls than you're interested in in the in the calendar at least mm -hmm. There always are more calls than we have time to make it to. Alas. Alas. Yeah. Thanks, Allison. Uh, we'll be right back to you because you're sort of next up in the queue. But first, Doug. Yeah, uh, here's a question. Uh, if we look at the physics of social change, that's not my typical position, but let's look at the physics of social change. Does interweaving projects together become part of the glue that keeps things from changing? Depends on how they're woven, I think. If because certainly if somebody starts a project, they want the project to continue. Uh, so it, if everybody's doing that, everybody's holding on. Um, if we do a perfect project plan and we have perfect dependencies and we create a rigid system, then yes, I think that the scenario you're, you're describing would be a problem because somebody would say, hey, I need to change direction. Everybody else would be like, no, you're not. I need your results for my project or whatever. Um, if you have loose couplings and very adaptive mindset, I don't know that it's a problem. I think that it, it creates synergies. And I'm just talking out of my butt here. Um, anybody else have strong feelings on this? I in, in my cosmology, I don't know if I would use the word physics, but in my com cosmology, um, the pro projects that I see are are fairly self-contained and and a little bit idiosyncratic so they they tend to flock together but they don't adhere very closely to each other um and you don't end up with group think um or group 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 um whatever um anybody else and and of course the that's the problem that we've got with uh the large political system in like in like the us and the large capitalist system right now everything is glued together and moving or or an, enough mass of maybe it's a minority of the the overall population but there's enough mass glued together and cohesive in a bad direction and part of what happened with, uh, when lockdown struck is that we had just in time had eaten the world and we had all sorts of inventory streams that depended on cheap containers and people in ports and a whole bunch of stuff and the supply chain was was fragile uh way more than it ought to be so we saw that play out in lots of different ways including like trying to find toilet paper in the first two weeks of the of the pandemic um Klaus. yeah the meeting i attended yesterday was organized by uh, a new ngo formed by the state and their mission is to combine the work of, of NGOs located in Oregon 
and create some form of alignment. So in the meeting yesterday, I mean, we had people from the High Desert Food and Farm Alliance, from Oregon Climate and Agriculture Network. I mean, about 30 different NGOs. And the presentation on water, for example, was kind of an aha moment, right? I mean, you can have all kinds of ideas and plans to change water, but here are the realities of how this all works. So to there, there are certain pieces of information you have to have in order to make decent decisions, right? And and uh, uh, the, the problem we have is that most uh, NGOs even work in buckets, right? They focus on one narrow part of the issue without understanding the systemic connections. So I do, I do think there is benefit in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in this kind of hive uh, thing. You know? I want to build on what you just said, Klaus, and tell a story some of you have heard before about tree people in Los Angeles, where this guy, Andy Lipkiss, who just was just trying to get LA to plant more trees, realized one day he saw a, a notice that the US Army Corps of Engineers was going to raise the walls on the emergency drainage ditches that cut across Los Angeles because it never rains in LA, but when it does rain because we've paved over all of it, it can be catastrophic. Lots of water collects up real fast and runs off. And so he managed to, uh, over time, bring together a series of agencies at, at different levels, You know, whether it was neighborhood or, or state or city or whatever, he managed to collect them together and start looking at each other's sort of assets and timing and missions and all that. And they discovered they had overlapping assets, uh, contradictory mandates, a whole, they were working against each other. They had resources they could share, a whole bunch of, of synergies and dynamics that came out of it, uh, which, would, which just aren't, weren't normally happening because these were all silos and which were highly productive for improving the LA basin's ability to hold water and do other things. And so uh, I wish that that could be repeated everywhere. I wish that more agencies, and it sounds class like in Oregon, they might be heading in that direction. Uh, and I would love that because I'm in Oregon uh, as well. And so um, I don't know, I, I would love to promote this as a, as a general thing. And, and if one could enhance that process with an ability to see the assets better, which is a thing we're still trying to do here, and then create loose couplings that are highly productive instead of rigid couplings that cause brittleness, you know, downstream, that would be even better. Yeah, if I, if I may, it's, as an example for my webinar next week, I mean, I'm actually, I mean, stressing because um, when you look into the government programs, it's, it, they're completely chaotic. I mean, my impression so far is that they have dozens of programs some of which overlap, none of them are really coordinated to achieve, you know, a targeted outcome. So in, in a in a sane world, you would go to a farmer and make and take an assessment, you know, of what does does this farm actually need to do in order to reduce nutrient inputs and prevent nutrient runoffs and things like this and restore soil back to life. But it's different in, in each farm. And these programs really only work like you know, I'm going to fix watersheds and I'm going to do pollinator strips and I'm going, and, and there is no coordinating effort, right? So I think what we will highlight in the webinar next week, and I'm trying to do this as gentle as possible because I so appreciate the government officials who are stepping in to actually do this, um, of, you know, how do we coordinate all these things, right? How do we uh, 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 bring in some structure here, which would be normal in a business environment, but for some reason the government is just shredded. You know? Thank you very much. Um, let's go back to our queue, which I am very slow in getting us through. My apologies. So, Allison, Ken, Hank, and Allison's got uh, a lo lovely project to describe, which I hopefully you can reload into your brain now and and tell us about. Oh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I haven't been popping into the group for a while, but um, I have relocated, took a year off of my teaching after tense burnout from the 2020-21 school years and um, decided that the things that I'd been working on teaching, uh, I needed to put to test out in communities because it's quite radically different, you know, teaching economics and government with everything that you guys are saying. <laughs> right. It, um, it just feels a little bit um, negligent to really harnessing the essence of the moment, which for me 
is about harmonizing brains um, to be able to think clearly in times like these. Young brains are great. <laughs> um, so I appreciate the position that I'm in right now. Um, I moved to Kenya and I'm uh, partnering with Grassroots Economics, which has been, I'm not sure. Has anybody in the group heard of this organization in Kenya? Yeah, you guys uh -huh. have heard of it. Yeah, and we've yeah. talked about it. I think, uh, I think Kevin Jones brought it to our attention. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, it came to my attention when I was visiting family in Tanzania in 2017, and I'd been teaching already about community currencies and said I'm wanting to, you know, I had passion for it and found them. Um, Grace Rachmani actually uh, is, is friends with Will Reddick who started it and had been an advisor for a little bit. And now they're working on starting it down, you know, so it's, they're using crypto in, um, not really crypto, but blockchain in resource scarce environments using USSD phones and mesh networks and things like that are getting to the point where they are um, and, and empowering people to start their own vouchers, right? So it's to create their own money instead of using somebody else's. And the ideas have a lot of integrity and the dress that I'm wearing right now, actually, I bought yesterday at a community who, yeah, was um, barely flu I'm fluent in Swahili, but they speak the local language. You know, this is definitely a, a long drive out on the dirt road, right? Resource scarce, but they had their own currencies and I got to buy this dress with that. So. It was amazing to be able to participate and to work on regenerative agriculture from a solution oriented place. And I think that that's a way to drive conversation. It's kind of interesting, like if we all just reflected on how much time we spent, like the, the complexity of problems is really, really large, obviously. Um, and talking about the problems could, you know, we, we could all easily spend the rest of our lives doing that. Um, which, you know, is a direction of thought. It's a thought direction. And it's not to say that we turn on blinders when we uh, don't look uh, deeply at the problems. We certainly know that they're there. And we can even spend a whole lot of time debating about what's the most important problem or what's the truth of the problem, right? But then that's all time that we're not spending looking at, at growing and cultivating Solutions. So from a mental health perspective, I found it really, really critical that we take a design approach, since especially the um, textbooks can be very political and ideological and not evidence-based and things like that, um, contentious and whatnot. And so I think opening things up to a design perspective is probably the best way to harness curiosity. Um, so, so that is me taking a year of trying to use some of the frameworks that I've been working with with students to begin. And I, I emailed Jerry yesterday to tell him about it because I wanted to tell you guys about it. And um, Shimon also has done a lot of work with Saluda Genesis. And so I had, as well as a public health educator and, um, and working in forest, <laughs> forest bathing, actually research on the impacts of forest bathing and mindfulness came across the salutogenic framework. And over time, just percolating and recognizing as I look at human needs, right, with students in order to get to economic design, that that salutogenic framework was a really great way to frame the economy. And, and so, so using that framework and using some others, um, we, we, you know, call, I'm calling it relational design. So borrowing from pro-social <laughs> communication and other things, how do we get past some of our biases and our blocks and deal with that internal ecosystem and radiate to the outward ecosystem and create economic ecosystems that can work now for us and, and dive into those and it was interesting, somebody had posted that states are, you know, were supposed to be models for what works and, you know, designing like, okay, well, this state's going to do that. And this state's going to do that. Great. Like we, we should have some flexibility and then we can watch and see what works best. But the state is still like too big, you know, and it still is. So 
within the cracks that we see, there is so much, so much, so much possibility. And, um, and so I think that it's important to spend time on that. So we're going to be piloting courses that are a year long academic year in secondary schools across a couple of different countries, university programs um, a couple, across a couple different countries, and then 12 week courses that are microcosms of that year long academic course, trying to help train people to be econ grassroots economists so that they can go into communities and help communities start these um, community inclusion currencies, so to speak, or the voucher system that's tied into an overall DAO investment sort of opportunity, but also supported by humanitarian aid. And, um, and um, yeah, so anywhere around the world, be able to have a certain standard on creating currencies, because as you know, right now, and you see the crypto world trying to solve problems, trying to, trying to focus on refi, um, a lot of it comes with some poor, poor design and millions of dollars go into these things and, and they collapse and don't do anybody any good. So um, I'm really excited about the job, the, the, the possibility. And so maybe since Pete, you made that calendar, just going to put it to the group, I can either just kind of invite and throw out an invitation to some of the 12 week courses, because I'm looking for feedback, like I'm I, I want to be able to test this with a number of different diverse communities. You guys think and talk about economic systems and have a deep breadth of knowledge, technical understanding, political understanding. And I think that you would be a, a really awesome crew to have, to take me to task, so to speak, you know, and provide feedback on what, what works, what makes sense, ask questions. Um, the materials still really need to be developed for public consumption, um, but, but um, the concepts are, are there and developing and, and I'd love to be able to invite this group to go through a process that would probably look like an hour and a half a week of discussion and maybe some readings and then boom. So, yeah. Um, Allison, thank you. Now you shared a draft uh, Google doc with me, which is uh, about three or so pages long. It's not a huge document, which might be useful. I don't know if you wanna share that with the group. Also, yeah. um, we've got the Mattermost server. I don't, are you on Mattermost? Do you have an account there? Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I, yeah, we, if you we, could share that link, then, um, maybe we will do that. And Pete, I don't know which channel that, which existing channel might be a great place to put this, or we could, we, if you wish, Allison, we could start a new channel for this. Um, you could start in, uh, OGM Town Square. Yeah. <laughs> Um, OGM Town Square is where we're putting the call information for each of these calls, and 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 then if the conversation gets energy, it can spawn its own channel. So uh, we will share a link to that in the chat. Um, that's a really good place for you to say, here's here's some resources, here's some questions, and then we can all kind of tackle it. And there, Allison just posted a link to the Google Doc. Um, yeah, thanks, you guys. Let's yeah, thanks, Allison. Any questions or thoughts for Allison? Mm -hmm. I, I, you mentioned many, many different interesting and useful practices and systems and uh, communities kind of in that document, which made me ask you to like link it up a little more, but I went off on a bunch I of I did, tangent. yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. I went off and, you know, uh, this whole other idea of rela relational design, uh, there's a couple different risks on that that I don't think you're pointing to, but that are also interesting, uh, like mm -hmm. relational design thinking is a thing. Uh, and of course, I'm- Wait, I'm, relational systems thinking. Uh, there's also relational design thinking that is a riff on design thinking. So there's many. There's like the, the, wait there's, a minute. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. There's lots of there's lots of sort of parallel strands here that uh, make maybe sure. originating from very different places, but it's really interesting. Sure. Yeah. 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 Cool. Um, All right. So that... Thank you, and yeah, and thanks. thanks for thanks for joining us from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um. Let's go back to the queue then, which is Ken Hank Mike. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm still reading this really fantastic book by Damon Santola called Change, How to Make Big Things Happen. And um, I'm about two thirds of the way through now. And I was noticing the earlier um, chatter on the OGM mailing list about um, uh, 
should we revitalize the OGM uh, LinkedIn group and what might that do for us? And I wanted to write uh, back to that, but I don't feel I have the, I haven't got all of the concepts from change in my mind yet, so I don't feel like I can make a really good case, but what comes to me and it's easier to explain verbally than try and write it is, is that um, if we really thought about what do we wanna do? So Klaus, for example, often posts questions, you know, in, in his um, emails and says, you know, why don't people see this? And, and um, this brings us to the we, you know, who is we? There, there's, um, can I share my screen for a second, Jerry? Yes, it's, uh, the default is that anyone can share the screen. Okay, so here's an example of we, if I can find it. Um, this is from Yale's Climate 360. Um, these are the people who, um, uh, alarmed, concerned, cautious, so we have 33, 25, 70. It's a huge number of people over here on the left who are very concerned about climate change. And then the disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive make up a much, much smaller percentage. So why, for example, don't the people on the left have way more power and way more um, influence in the social sphere than those on the on the right? And um, it's interesting that they happen to be lined up left to right like that. Um, and then looking at Centola's book on change, um, he details the way that uh, Twitter spread. Um, so it started here in the Bay Area and it took over the Valley in San Francisco and, and it looked like it was just growing gangbusters and they thought it'll be in Portola Valley any day. But it didn't actually get to Portola Valley for a long time because it went from the Bay Area to Cambridge, Massachusetts um, through what Centola would call wide bridges. Um, and I, I think if we can start to figure out, we need a diversity of... Um, of people who are speaking our language. The, those of us in OGM, we talk to each other. We're our own echo chamber. We all, you know, we understand what we're talking about. And so we don't have a huge amount of influence on people who are looking and saying, those are those OGM people. But if we can reach out to our networks individually and start to say, hey, you know, this is really some important stuff. We'd like to try and build some wide bridges to activate other networks. Then I think we'd actually start to see people really getting involved. Um, the I go back to, uh, what was his name? Paul, somebody, the cultural creatives, Paul Ray. You know, he said that that there's this huge number of, of um, green and deep green people in the States, but they're all looking forward. They don't recognize that there's people all around them who share their their same concerns. So it's not a matter of trying to convince the disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. It's a matter of bringing together the alarmed, concerned, and cautious in new ways to make them see that there's this huge percentage of us that that have um, that share these concerns. So I want to put that out to OGM of how could we um, use our influence in our diverse networks to try and link this together so that we do spread um, OGM social innovations. And, uh, you know, Centola's work is around information is a simple contagion that spreads just like a virus, but social innovations that, that require us to um, be exposed to risk of, of social risk or financial risk or um, any other type of risk, those are complex contagions. They don't travel and they don't grow and spread in the same way that, that simple contagions do. And I think it's a real, um, it was a wonderful distinction for me because it, it helped me to see, ah, this is why this isn't spreading. It's a complex contagion. It's a different contagion infrastructure is his language for it. So anybody who wants to hang out and read that book and talk about how can we create a, um, a complex contagion infrastructure to spread OGMness through the world. I'm right there. Me too, thank you. I think that's the, those that I'm the dynamics you're describing are really important to the work many of us are trying to do. That may seem too obvious, Klaus. Yeah, it brings me back to basic marketing. You know, segmentation is the best uh, uh, predictor of behavior and, and predictor of, of response. So, um, like you know, in, in, in my case, we're strategizing to shift agricultural practices to become regenerative and to sequester carbon and all of these things. Well, you have one uh, segment that's, let's say, mothers, you know, women. Uh, and they freak out when they understand that there's glyphosate in the children's cereal and that there are traces of glyphosate most likely in their breast milk and in urine samples of children. 
and the then the the, the toxic influence uh, on on the brain development on the uh, uh, child development caused by chemicals uh, contained in the food supply then you go uh, and talk with uh, people who live uh, in Florida and see dead fish along their beaches and link that to the runoff from the Mississippi River Delta, bringing nutrients down, bringing farm runoff, you know, into their into their land. So there is there is a meta perspective, you know, of what of what we're trying to accomplish, and then then you translate this into a context of people you're trying to reach and. That context has to be adapted to uh, population groups you know, that live in specific mindsets. You know? And that's the only way I know how to do it. Uh, it's, and, and, you know, I mean, with the Farm Bill, we have, re we have created a very effective strategy that uh, uh, has, has run below all the built-in defenses of the industrial sector resisting change. Um, and it's getting it's getting critical. So so that's I think is the answer you now is to segment to segment uh, the population groups you're trying to address, and and look at how this particular problem you're trying to solve, in uh, in uh, uh, impacts their circumstances and their context. Absolutely. Um... Thank you. Let's go, Hank, Mike, Eric. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, really interesting conversation so far. There are a lot of things I'd like to talk about or refer to. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, Allison's uh, starting from a solution place or uh, Ken spreading OGMness through the world, and, and maybe some of the things I say will relate to uh, topics like that. But my check in is about questions uh, that have been provoking me to do some deeper synthesis style thinking. So, as I often say, I don't have the answers, but I do have a number of questions. Uh, one of the things I'm quite uh, uh, involved in is this issue of youth uh, climate anxiety and in various conversations both in OGM calls and uh, a meta project call and uh, emails with people like Wendy McLean and Wendy Elford we've been knocking ideas back and forth uh, one of the really promising ideas that seems to be emerging also uh, due to conversations with a uh, friend of mine who is a Afghan uh, adolescent psychiatrist here in the Netherlands is that it's important uh, not to deal just with the symptoms, anxiety, without dealing at the same time with the real issue, climate. So if you talk about youth climate anxiety, uh, anxiety is a symptom and the real issue is climate. And uh, the idea that's emerging is that it's better to acknowledge and accept anxiety and our vulnerability uh, and then appeal to people's creativity, uh, asking them, okay, we understand you're anxious, I'm anxious too, you feel vulnerable, I'm vulnerable too. But when you think about what we need to do in this situation with the emphasis on do, ask people, well, what do you want to do? And ask it of an adolescent and ask it of a child. So I'm trying to relate a number of interesting issues that I've discovered or been made aware of in recent weeks to this. Uh, just put a list of them in the, in the chat. Uh, one of them is the, 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 the need to search for the adjacent possible concept uh, first uh, developed by Stuart Kaufman, I believe, at the Los Angeles Institute and taken up uh, by others. The idea of the ecology of freedom, which comes to me through the uh, discussions of the book uh, Dawn of Everything, and especially what author David Wencrow uh, says the importance of the third freedom, the freedom to imagine 
alternative social orders and put these alternatives into effect. And then there's the concepts I've listed as number three, referencing Henry Mintzberg of community ship and how to encourage people's engagement with community ship. And the fourth is negative capability. I think I mentioned that the last time I was on the call. Uh, comes from the poet John Keats uh, back 200 uh, years ago, uh, which he called the capacity of the greatest writers to pursue uh, their vision of artistic beauty, even when it leads them into intellectual confusion and uncertainty. And intellectual confusion and uncertainty is one way to describe the state of the world right now. And the fifth issue has to do with art itself. It's building on the last one, but I think it involves all of the things I've said up till now. And thinking beyond aesthetics, what is the role of art in society and in social engagement? And I want to just mention briefly a couple of things. I don't know if there's uh, much news about it in the United States. It's a big issue in Europe. Uh, Documenta uh, uh, held a big art exhibition held every five years in Europe. Uh, uh, this year in Kassel in Germany, this year it's been uh, uh, curated by an Indonesian art collective. And because one of the works of art uh, that was this, and, and the emphasis is on non-Western art for the first time ever in 15 documentas, the emphasis is on non-Western art. And in one of the installations, there was something that was called anti-Semitic, although it was uh, done uh, more than actually more than 20 years ago. It's had as a cartoon uh, uh, someone identified as an Israeli soldier uh, with the face of a pig. And although, excuse me if I don't want to step on anyone's uh, feelings here or long toes, although Germany. Uh, effectively uh, eliminated 99% of all its Jews during the Second World War. Suddenly, two generations later, there's a big to do about uh, anti Semitism, and you can't show anti Semitic art in Germany. Uh, the director of the documentary resigned. Some of the most famous uh, uh, German artists taking part withdrew their work. Although essentially it had to do with depicting an art collective, non-European art collective's view of what the Israeli army was doing 20 years ago. Be that as it may. I'm hoping to visit the document uh, uh, next month, if it's still open, <laughs> if there's still any art there, to see for myself what's going on when uh, you invite non-Western uh, curators to curate what's supposed to be an international exhibition and uh, start involving uh, uh, issues of, uh, what shall we say, uh, art's role in society. Uh, social comment. And then there are other individual artists that are very interesting. American artist Alicia Eggert, uh, Japanese artist Tatsui Miyajima, uh, who are making art that ask very important questions about time and about uh, change and about connections and about uh, how long is forever. Uh, unfortunately, I only have reference to uh, Alicia Eckert's work through an article uh, published on the website of The Long Now. There's a reference to it. Uh, Tatsui Miyajima uh, has an exhibition uh, about time and forever in a Dutch uh, museum, which I'm hoping to visit on Saturday. And then there's poetry. Uh, nothing new in the work of Maya Angelou, unfortunately she passed away some years ago, but I've actually rediscovered her work and especially uh, her work about And I Still Rise, 
uh, a fantastic poem about how the artist uh, as a uh, perhaps how the perception of a person could be I'm a victim of society yet the perception of Angel of Maya Angelo as an artist is there's nothing like a victim if you still rise and all through her life she did still rise. So those are a number of concepts that uh, are trying to provoke me in deep thought and anyone uh, on this call or who hears this uh, recording of this call who's interested in uh, shedding some light or asking new questions about them. Uh, I welcome uh, uh, all inputs. Hank, that was a very rich trove of things you just put in front of us. Thank you. Um, anyone want to comment or offer pointers or suggestions? Um, I'm also interested in kind of where are you pointing this flashlight and what would you like to sort of do next with this basket of things? Uh, well, to go back to my first set of sentences about uh, Allison's talking about working from a solution space and Ken's uh, suggestion about uh, spreading the OGMness of these type of discussions around the world. And I strongly believe that arts however we define it, has a role in it, but I can't yet put a fingers on how or what. Uh, I mean, there's one way of looking at it and saying everyone's artistic. So everyone creates art in their own lives and that art should be made more um, visible to people. And the other way of looking at it is saying for 80% of the people in the world, maybe more, art is something far, far off. It's something they do, those elitists and those uh, people in their ivory towers. But if you get the art that speaks to those 80%, I think great things are possible. And how? I, I just have a question at the moment, but I think in spreading the OGMness and working from a solution space as opposed to a crisis space or a calamity space or a despair space, there might be ways forward which we need to explore together in conversation. Uh, it's a bit fuzzy, I'm, I'm afraid, but oh, I'm, I'm still still asking questions. Oh, that's great. Um, you just reminded me of a fellow I ran across some time ago who called himself a knowledge artist and triggered, of course, in my head, oh, maybe I'm a knowledge yeah. artist. Uh, my, my palette is limited, but, but I see a piece of what I do is like what a librarian or, or other kind of information architect might do, but a piece of what I do is some kind of art. I don't know. And, uh, so, uh, I kind of like that. Uh, my... I, you're definitely a knowledge artist, Jerry, but I mean, from listening to the people on this and the other OGM calls, I'm sure every one of us could have some kind of uh, label uh, of being a thinking artist, uh, an, act, uh, an, an action artist, a Klaus perhaps, or, or whatever, but it, it's not about labels, it's about the work we do and making it more accessible to people, as I think that was the, 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 the background of, of, of your proposal, Ken. Cool, thank you. Mike. Sorry, um, I'm spending much of the day at the Internet Governance Forum USA. Wow. Uh, it's a meeting bringing people together to debate the issues that will shape the future of the internet. But I wanted to share Klaus's funk. Um, he's talking about agriculture and food policy. I'm talking about digital policy. And it, it, it really is just so unfortunate that the political process, not just in the United States, is completely broken down. Um, one of our um, senior executives at the Carnegie Endowment is stepping down from his leadership role. And he said, policy seems to be either stuck or surreal. And it's, it, it really is 
almost like people have given up trying to find consensus around solutions, even though there are some low hanging fruit out there. Uh, I, I do think what this group does is incredibly important. One of the things we're trying to do at Carnegie is use LinkedIn as a, a way to foster discussions and help people identify uh, people who have common interests. I don't know if anybody here can guide me to a handbook on LinkedIn groups, but uh, I, I could I could use that. Right? We're using LinkedIn because people are already there. It's mm -hmm. not trying to pull people into something new. And we're 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 sort of thinking of it as a kind of a hub or a, even a clubhouse, um, and not just for research activities, but. If I want to find someone to play ping pong with in our ping pong room or go running with, or, or if there's some great event that I want to tell people with so that my friends don't miss out a great opportunity over the weekend. It, it's, it's not like Slack. It's not meant to be real time, but it's, it, it's sort of a way to get more acquainted with the different dimensions of the people you work with. So I'm, I'm looking for any help on that if, that people can provide. Uh, obviously, past conversations of this group have helped me think about how to motivate people to collaborate. Um, I am although hopeful. I, I did spend breakfast with Cynthia Chen, C-H-Y-N, who's in charge of policy for uh, Amazon Web Services in Taiwan. And Taiwan is doing some so many things right. They just created a new digital ministry. And Audrey Tang, who had been kind of, uh, not, not a minister, but head of a sort of an open source project to make the internet and the information space of Taiwan better, is being dragged kicking and screaming into the bureaucracy. Oh. If you haven't read about Audrey Tang, you need to. Audrey I mean, is fabulous. I've got a, I did an incredible. interview with her and Xu Yang Lin back in 2017, which I'll post to the chat. Audrey's fantastic. Yeah, I've been in a several different discussions and uh, that gave me hope. But it's it's sort of the uh, they are the anti bureaucrats, you know. They're they're working from the outside to the end, and and now Audrey will be in charge of this ministry and have to manage things in a different way. But anyway, that's that's uh, what, what gets me excited, and I, I'm also flying to Portland in about four hours, and that's got me very excited. Ooh, because, awesome! Uh, Kathleen has never mm -hmm. been to Oregon. Um, and I, I don't know if you're around, Jerry, but I'd love to love to connect at some Sounds point. Uh, just let me know. I sent you an email this morning. Just to, I have not made it through my email, so I will find it. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, or just call. We can. I mean, I, I'm. I we have some time tomorrow for lunch, or from on Monday we could also meet up. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to drop off. I have to head off to a session, but hey, you can hey. watch all of the IGF USA online. Uh, really fascinating talks. Thanks for joining us. That's really, uh, that was great. <clears throat> um, well, a little depressing with a little bit of hope at the end. Uh, well, that's, hey, that's our current state. Um, and one of the things about Audrey and V Taiwan, which is one of the umbrella names for the project she's involved with, Polis is another one. There's a whole bunch of, it's like virtual democracy that's working really quite well. And Audrey has been a minister without portfolio trying to sort of nurture these, these infrastructures for democracy. I think they're essential to Taiwan's long-term survival. And I think the danger to the Pu People's Republic of China is that they see how fruitful this is for connecting humans in the middle of Xi trying to deal with protests around mortgages and bank failures. And I'm reading all kinds of stuff that's just burbling under the surface in, 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 the, in, in mainland China, which is causing all sorts of havoc. And, and it somehow feels to me, and this is probably hopelessly idealistic, that a high functioning democracy, which actually is very representational uh, and conversational and high trust might in fact uh, be a weapon of some sort. And I can understand and appreciate Audrey's not wanting to be dragged into the bureaucracy. And I think I can also understand how what she's doing might be seen as central and vital and essential to Taiwan's thriving in the face of mainland China's wanting to Put it in the tractor beams and drag it back inside as they have now sort of done with hong kong um anyway separate thread worth a lot more conversation in different places anyone else with thoughts on this uh if not we um lost my thread here uh 
Mike just left us, so let's go Eric, Doug, Bill. Uh, Eric, do you, did you want to stay on the chat or do you want to, yeah, uh, did you want to jump in? Sorry, I was unmuted. Uh, I was muted there. Um, so there. I want to cool. talk a little. So what's on my mind is where is the borderline between creativity and mania? And we don't have to answer that question, but um, like what I could see myself is like doing like 20 different things that interest me and uh, realizing that, okay, well, I could use like Stephen Covey's matrix for prioritization. Like if it's uh, quadrant two, where it's um, not urgent and um, or important, then that's the best quadrant to be in. Uh, but uh, there's urgent stuff. And then there's uh, things that are urgent to other people, but not me. Um, <laughs> And then there's uh, the, the quadrant four, not urgent, not important, uh, where if you where sometimes I just need to take a break and go there. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a framework that's helped me in the past. And I've even made a spreadsheet to like put things in, assign them quadrants and sort it and then see. But I'm never really following through consistently with any methodology. It's like I could do something and um, keep it in my mind and then just go forward and then I'm surfing, the surfing life wherever it takes me. And uh, how do I know whether someone's manipulating me in a certain place? And uh, I, I, I see a boundary right now that I have to be very careful of. So uh, that's just where I am now. And uh, I'll be fine. It's just uh, a process of living and deciding how to live. Thanks. Um, thanks, Eric. Um, Pete. It's a great question, Eric. And, and um, actually, one of, the, one of the diagnostic ways to know if you're being creative or manic is when you can ask that question. Um, but the, I, the large scale thing is, or, or you know, the, the, the main thing, um, if you can, if you and your team uh, can you know, self-regulate, you, you can feed yourself and bathe yourself and clothe yourself and live in a place and not run out of money and stuff like that, you know, then you're doing okay, you're coping. Um, uh, when one of those things starts to fall off, um, uh, it's, it's bad. Um, and maybe you're, maybe you're in a manic, you know, cycle. I, I, I don't think you're talking about you, but just kind of in general. Um, the, uh, one of the things I said there was, I didn't say when you can't cope, right? I said you and your team can't cope. Um, one of the, uh, one of the failure modes of humans is to end up, uh, isolated from other humans and then coping gets a lot harder, right? When you have two people, when you have another person, you can kind of like bounce ideas off of, or, or discuss things with, or a three people, or even a small community that when you can do part of your self-regulation in community with other people and then help them self-regulate too, um, then that's kind of a win um, and vice versa. When you know you can't find the community to help you regulate yourself, then you're in trouble. And I just wanted to add two things to that. One is I'm pointing right now in my brain to the hearing voices movement. And there's been a, a shift in thinking about schizophrenia, for example, which involves auditory hallucinations. And I don't, I, I'm not loading enough of this back into my head, um, but there's not a normalization of schizophrenia, but a different understanding of how schizophrenia might be affecting people and what it is, which is really, really interesting. And I think that sort of slowing down and unpacking that rather than seeing this as something to be medicated away or, ever, or, or whatever is interesting. And then I'm really personally interested in internal family systems or IFS, which says that we have psychological subparts. All of us are composed of subparts, just like family systems therapy says that families are systems. And then they, they sort of compensate and overcompensate and, and have dynamics inside of families. IFS goes inside the individual and says, hey, guess what? It's systems all the way down. And we have parts that are in conflict or that are trying to do things. Most of our parts, the theory goes, are trying to be helpful. Really, they want to be. And the IFS therapy involves finding who your actual sort of inner self is and then 
talking to the parts in a friendly way to align them so that they're in fact feeling like they're contributing to the mission and they're not harming you. And so uh, if anybody's, you know, if someone's be acting in dysfunctional ways or has self-destructive behaviors, often that's a part that's a little out of control, which is interacting with the other parts. That's probably too much time spent on the definition, but it feels like these ways of understanding us personally and our boundaries between creativity, mania, uh, and achievement and all those kinds of things, it, it seems like the principles are sort of similar at societal levels and personal levels and group levels. And we're maybe making some progress in understanding those things as some kind of set of primitive theories, although I may again be too optimistic there. Thank you, Jerry. I um, just want to comment. Um, I think as a group, it's important to understand the boundaries of the group and uh, subgroups and individuals. And uh, when a crisis occurs, to have something in place of how the group plans to respond. And a lot of this is covered in codes of conduct um, and uh, in other groups. So uh, just something to think about. Uh, I mean, this will take a long time to flesh out, but I just wanted to put it out there. Thank you. Um, anyone else with thoughts on this whole thing? I, I, I'm not someone else, but um, <laughs> I, boundaries, boundaries is, uh, is an important thing, Eric. Um, and, and then another thing is uh, uh, kind of coordinating um, a group of friends or something like that. And then another thing is, that's important is when you when the the boundary between permission and not permission to help somebody um uh, that's a, a tricky thing to navigate and and that's another thing where it helps maybe i can't help somebody who needs help and doesn't doesn't you know it's, it's pushing me away but when i have two or three people um and we decide it's the right time to help or it's not the right time to help that's that's super helpful um so like that's like second order, you know, group or something like that, being able to come together with a few people and go, is it time to cross this person's boundary, even though they don't want it? Um, uh, and maybe sometimes it is. Thanks, Pete. And thank you, Eric. Um, let's go, Doug, Bill, Rick. Uh, we're sort of out of time, but uh, Doug, if you want to dive in. Nothing like starting. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sometimes I start with you, sometimes uh, I end with you. My apologies. Uh, two thoughts. One is why are things happening faster than we expected them to, especially climate things? If you can remember back to when one and a half degrees looked like a reasonable target, uh, or that we would solve our problems by 2050 or 2100, now it's right on top of us. What did we get wrong? Second thought. Should we be working on some kind of lifeboat strategy? End of thoughts. Um, so there are movements. Well, it's interesting. Uh, brief, brief response to to your great two questions. Uh, and I just want to type in the second question. Oh, good. Uh, Pete already got that. Um, when you look in, when you look back after some massive event, it turns out a whole bunch of people were usually saying, "Hey, this is happening," and nobody was paying attention to them. Uh, one of the reasons I like the Big Short is that Michael Lewis does the work to go find six very quirky individuals who profited from the global financial crisis because they saw that it was basically a Ponzi scheme, house of cards, whatever thing you want to call it, and then figured out how to bet against it despite everyone around them pissing, being like incredibly pissed off and saying, you can't do this, no way, no how. So there's, there's almost always minority voices that are saying what's going on. Uh, second is that in order to fit their predictions into political discourse and other discourse, a lot of scientists, I think, may have biased toward cons being conservative in their estimates about the possibilities of change. Couple that with the unpredictability of non and nonlinearity of dynamic systems, comp complex dynamic systems like weather and heat, and all, all sorts of other things, and that turns into the like this pudding of a potential disaster and accelerating disaster, and so uh, so I think that that's like right we're in the middle of that because once things start to tip, like you know the uh, 
the Antarctica starts to melt, it interrupts the oceanic currents, which interrupt the jet stream, which cause heat waves in, in across Europe. And that is climatologist conjecture that seems to be, uh, you know, behaving properly uh, as a conjecture right this minute across large parts of the globe. Uh, and might be really hard to prove definitively for anybody. I don't know. I, I, I am no scientist or anything like that, but we're kind of in the, in the middle of all those sorts of things. Um, and last thought I'll put in, uh, I don't understand why conservatives don't want to think about Pascal's wager here, which is uh, my, my primitive understanding of it is, you know, Pascal, who was a philosopher and mathematician and so forth, said, you know, just in case there is a God, even though I don't believe in God, I should like go get blessed so that I'll end up in heaven <clears throat> in case when I die. And, and here it's like, conservatives seem to be betting the farm and much more than the farm. I think betting the farm is a quaint idiom in this case, uh, that the politics of this matters more than the actual physics of this. And I hate that. That's, that's, really, that's really depressing me. Uh, I, I'm not liking that whatsoever. So, uh, Doug, thank you for putting two really provocative questions into the into the conversation. And if you want to jump back in, feel free. Uh, if not, let's go uh, to Bill then uh, Rick. And we'll hang out for a couple more minutes because if you need to leave, of course you leave. <clears throat> Allison had her hand up for quite a while. Pardon? Thanks. Actually, I just um, put it oh, up uh, to, in response, and I typed okay. my um, typed my answer there. So I'll exit too. Anyway, I got to get going because it's getting late. Um, Thanks Bill, for thank hearing you. my pitch, folks. But yeah, that my pitch was kind of the answer to the question too, and so I guess I'll verbalize it. My take is that we take on too much of swimming um, in a cognitive depth of what's wrong and trying to consider solutions that are too too big um, rather than seeing what works and, and and we're getting to the point where we can rapidly information share so hopefully that cosmo local um, reader that i shared up earlier might be of interest to you guys i thought it might be but hopefully you'll get some feedback addressing these issues of um, eco-anxiety amongst youth and solutions that they mm -hmm. might have by connecting with nature. All right, peace. Thanks. Thank you so much. Sorry, I can't stick around. Bye. Oh, thanks for being here. Um, Bill. Hello. Uh, very generative uh, call. So I appreciate having the time to sit in and listen. I don't... Um, I don't really have any questions. So, well, there's only one question I want to throw out that's come up. Just thinking about what we've said. Um, so this is just off the top of my head. With all the the work going on now to sort of build up decentralized, autonomous ways of organizing, it's like you know, like we're gonna let's get away from like you know the big. Let's all just get into little pods or sovereigns or whatever you know and what my question is how will is that maladaptive to really trying to solve issues that basically need to be worked on in a large social way i it just feels like I don't know. I so I just it's just come up for me that there's this tension here, especially in the U.S. You know, we're going to go with the federalists. Who needs a federal government? Fuck those people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, it's just a freaking disaster, and a, you know, they just waste money. It's like hello, <laughs> but um, I feel like that. I don't. I feel that that might also happen with a lot of like we're just going to decentralize and be autonomous and take care of you know, what we can take care of. And it's like, hmm. hmm. I don't know about since, you know, what you need to take care of involves everybody, mm -hmm. all of us. So um, I just, I know it's a question for me right now. I don't know what to, how to 
manage that. I will say that to help with my emotional state, which, you know, Klaus really always puts the finger on. So I appreciate that, Klaus. Um, I've just been reading more poetry, and especially the poetry of the, our upcoming poet laureate, Ada Limon, which I highly recommend. Um, you know, anyway, that's just to take care of my, uh, <laughs> the other part of my brain. Um, Bill, thank you very much. Um, Rick. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, I feel fortunate to, to come at the end, even though I arrived a little bit late. Um, but I'd like to provide a perspective of a, a lurker and interloper of this group. I've only, this is my third time I've come. And so um, I'd like to share a perspective that resonates with some of the earlier comments. It's a pity Alison has left because I'd love to connect up with her. I thought she described was uh, really amazing. So I'm curious to learn more about her work. But the comments that, um, that Mike and Ken made about uh, OGM, I mean, all organizations have a sort of inner sanctum, an outer sanctum, an outer, and then people who are beyond that. And I'm very much on the fringe looking in. And I think one of the challenges of complex contagium is how do you attract people uh, who have weak ties to, to, to aggregate around cause. And um, one of the things that um, I find um, a little overwhelming, uh, not being a sort of regular on the, um, in, uh, on the emails, it's difficult to keep up with things. And it's not organized in a way that I feel I can develop coherence because I'm not, I'm inconsistent. If you're consistent, it's, if you're in the inner sanctum, that's different because you get to know the people and whatever. So it creates a sort of a little bit of an artificial barrier for people for entry, so to speak, even though it's got an amazing attraction to pull people in. And I want to go back to link the LinkedIn comment because LinkedIn to me is a, such a huge untapped potential for community building. It's not even designed for that purpose, but that doesn't mean to say you can't adapt it to that purpose. Um, and um, at one point I got heavily involved in, in uh, Clubhouse, just experience whatever, and uh, did it for several months, ran groups and whatever, and, and retreated from that. Um, and you, you probably know LinkedIn has got an audio capability now. Um, and somebody mentioned the LinkedIn group. I was, if, if this group were to take, go public with its comments, opposed to be in a sort of, you know, a closed uh, listserv, and it was more open, and there were episodic um, audios where you would have maybe like what you've just done here, you invite, you know, people, eight or 10 people commit themselves to replicate exactly this process. And you have people who will just listen in. The one problem with LinkedIn, though, is that they don't have the capacity to record at the moment, unlike Clubhouse. But that doesn't mean you can't record it and save it and post it after the event so that people can come. If they didn't meet the event, they could. So the issue then becomes, well, how do you design complex contagium if you want to uh, elevate uh, OGM, which I think that the more I'm sort of, yeah, I feel like I'm getting pulled in. I said, hey, this sounds interesting. I want to get, I want to, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, Jerry. And, but the thing is, how can you harness that? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you don't have to go woo-woo, but uh, <laughs> you know, sorcerer or whatever it is, but you know, it, it does, it does help the ring, yes. One um, ring to rule them all. Yeah, exactly. But you know how to to to. I just think I see such huge potential here. If it was, if maybe, um, I, maybe you've already had this discussion about how to orchestrate complex contagium of weak ties. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to develop a dis decentralized uh, leadership system, uh, you have to design it where people can pick up things and run with it themselves. And the thing about where I would disagree a little bit with Allison was I agree you have to have the sort of the, the, the local, the sort of the, the micro level thing. But at the macro level at OGM, you need to have an overarching vision that will help to facilitate these, you know, like a mycelium network of all these people doing things. And so the question is, how do you cultivate that? So. Uh, uh, you've intrigued me to get more involved. So um, I hope to come more often on Thursdays and maybe uh, encourage you to think about how to orchestrate all that great stuff that you're doing on internet and putting it somewhere where it's public 
and then it'll reduce uh, your entry barrier. So that's my two cents at the end. Rick, thank you. You've done a lovely job of actually sort of mycelially, -ly 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 -ly, hard to say, tying together so many of the themes that, that we started with and that we went through during the call uh, about infrastructure, about uh, uh, how to reach out and so forth. And, and I'm intrigued by LinkedIn. We just had a discussion uh, on the list about whether or not we should use the LinkedIn group that I started way back when, you know, two years ago when I when we started these conversations, I went into LinkedIn and created a group called OGM. It exists. Uh, and we've done nothing with it. <clears throat> we haven't sort of walked in and used it. I would be thrilled if we started doing something there. And I think the question is sort of what? Uh, for me, LinkedIn uh, brings a business audience, a very, very large business audience that you can engage in lots of interesting ways. So that's kind of cool. None of the platforms, Facebook or LinkedIn, are particularly optimal for these kinds of things, but they're not terrible for these kinds of things. Uh, so, oh, cool. So I will uh, go look at your uh, LinkedIn post. And, yeah, just uh, one, one question, just one last thing. I watched a movie called Mr. Jones. If you haven't seen it, it's an amazing document. It's an amazing story. It's linked into the article there, but it made me think about unsung heroes and he was an unsung hero. And I, I was wondering whether you've ever done a, a mental map of unsung heroes, giving recognition to people who have uh, you know, just don't get the credit and uh, recognition they do deserve. So if you have any unsung heroes. So the answer to that is yes, Rick. And this is oh. the thought. Uh, this <laughs> is exactly right. the thought. The, the center of my thesis around trust is built from stories I got from contrarians out there like uh, Christopher Alexander, uh, who created a pattern language, uh, like Hans Mondermann, uh, here's Hans, who was uh, who died some years ago, but he helped invent traffic calming, which counterintuitively says, if you if you if you subtract all the affordances we think create safety in traffic situations, and then redesign your intersections you know, thoughtfully, it turns out accident rates go down, throughput stays high, and you rebuild community because people are making eye contact again at the intersections. So so in many different fields of endeavor from parenting and child rearing to finance to uh, urban planning, uh, these are my heroes. And uh, mostly they're contrarians because they were rejected by their peers, yeah. uh, which means I think by definition, they didn't get that much attention in the way that you were intending uh, what you said. So I'm gonna post a link to that thought uh, to the chat right now. So you can browse I, I, it. If you could add it to the blog post, that would be even better. If you uh, have I'm going to put it in a couple of places, but it'll, okay, it'll it's great. in today's you. notes as well. But thanks for asking. Um, that was awesome. Uh, we've gone well over time, almost uh, 15 minutes over time. I really appreciate today's conversation. It really like it was heartening at a moment of of hard to find heart. Um, although in our communities, I think we find heart, and I really love that. I love that we come together in these ways to do that. Um, anybody else have a final thought? We're good. Um, thank you very much. See you on the tubes. Bye for now.